Absolutely. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone who's taking part in this apprenticeship uh, challenge uh, this spring. We have a wonderful guest this time uh, to join us. I get to welcome Samantha Atkins, um, who is a PhD in engineer and a scientist both, and she is uh, doing very interesting work at Moderna, and I will let her tell you about that and about her career pathways. So, um, and then, you know, we'll maybe take a couple of questions if there are student questions, um, and we'll leave you on your way. Smith, thank you so much for awesome. taking yes. time to talk to the students. You have such an interesting job and an interesting journey. Um, maybe we can start with the job that you're doing, and then we'll back up to how you got there. Absolutely, sure. So I'm a senior scientist at Moderna. I joined here a little over two years ago and I started up a group called Investigative Pathology. And so what that is, is I work very closely with vet pathologists on our team. We're in early research and development. So we're working on the medicines that are about five or 10 years away from the clinic. So all very novel, very new cutting edge kind of drugs that we're developing at our company. And we work in areas for cancer therapy, obviously vaccines that you guys probably know about our COVID-19 vaccine. We do um, a lot of different immunotherapies um, for autoimmune diseases. And we're also going after rare diseases. And the way that our medicines work is that we use something called mRNA. And um, you guys are probably a little bit familiar with that from your high school biology classes. But mRNA is the blueprint that your cells use to make a protein. And protein is kind of what your body makes. And that that's kind of what we see. And mRNA is kind of what we don't see. And so the, the way that we can leverage that is that if we can deliver mRNA into a cell, that's basically like delivering a gene that you might not have. So for people with rare autoimmune diseases or rare diseases where they're lacking a gene that makes them um, susceptible to some kind of disease, we can give them that gene and then their body will act as the bioreactor and make the protein from the gene that we deliver. So that's kind of the basis of our genes. And so what I do at Moderna is when our vet pathologists run a study, normally um, and traditionally in all pharmaceutical companies, you have to unfortunately put our medicine into animals before we can put them into human. And then we look and see, was this treatment effective and was it safe in the animals? Do we see any signs of toxicity? Is there anything wrong that we should be aware of before we get to humans? Because we want to make sure that it's safe. So I work with the vet to look at all of the, the organs after we do an animal study. Unfortunately, we have to kill the animals and then we take the tissues out of the animals and we can look at them and see, do they look normal? Do they look healthy still? Was our medicine effective? And if there's any time that our medicine looks like it might have caused a problem instead of helped, that's where I come in and I investigate what that problem is. So that's why it's called investigative pathology. So I'm really interested in looking at what is the molecular mechanism at the cell level that's driving this change that we see that we didn't want to see. And then how can I communicate that to our chemists so that they can change our molecules to make them safer? And one of the ways that I do this is I work with something called organ on a chip technology. And so you see um, the little chip, um, the hand that's holding that little, um, that's called a chip right under our vaccine picture. Yep, exactly right there. That is called an organ chip and it's made out of a flexible plastic like silicone. And what I can do is I can tissue engineer different cells in those chips to make any different organ in the body. And we can test our drugs on those instead of testing them on animals. So um, one thing that I'm doing is I'm trying to lower the amount of animals that we're testing on by replacing them with this organ chip technology. And then I'm also, what's really cool about these is we can put in human cells. So instead of using a bunch of mice or monkeys that don't really translate to human biology. Instead, we can make these little human organs and test our drugs on those. And they're more translatable to what we might see in the clinic. And then maybe we can have a better result or a better outcome with our drugs. So that's kind of the uh, what I do in a nutshell. 
Wow. Uh, amazing. I, I love the analogy that you made of the body as a bioreactor, taking mRNA and making protein. I've never heard that before and think that's amazing. And the uh, organ on a chip is a way to both diminish the number of animals that you have to use and to be able to use human cells instead of animal cells um, to test these because these are going to be going into humans. So um, that's ultimately where you want to be able to, to know very confidently that they're safe and effective. I think, I think it sounds great. Um, it does make me ask a question because I'm looking at your slide here that your dad was a taxidermist. Yes. Does that connect in any way to your it does. <laughs> so That kind of is what launched my love of science. And first it kind of started with anatomy lessons in our garage. Um, so on the side, my dad, so my dad was a machinist. Um, I'm from Northwest Indiana where we have a lot of steel mills. And so in his day job, he worked in a steel mill, but on the side, he had a taxidermy business. And if the students don't know what taxidermy is, that is the preservation of dead animals. So if you ever see like a hunting lodge where they have like deer heads on the walls or, or animal pelts and things like that that's what taxidermists do. They preserve the animal hide. And so in order to preserve the hide, you have to obviously work with a dead animal and you have to dissect it, take all its organs out, and then you have to fix it with certain chemicals to preserve it. And so I grew up around my dad who was dissecting animals in our garage. And so, you know, at a very early age, I was getting anatomy lessons as he was taking the organs out of the animals and handing me livers and spleens and kidneys and explaining to me what they were. And once I saw the inside of the body and saw how it worked, I just really became fascinated with anatomy. And I really, for most of my life growing up, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. Um, and that's really what I pursued. You know, in high school, I was preparing myself to go to pre-med for college. I thought that's what I really wanted to do. And then I had an experience in high school where I was allowed to shadow some doctors at a hospital. And I ended up going there and realizing like, wow, this is kind of a traumatic job. Um, my first day in the hospital, I was in the radiology department where they do x-rays. And I thought, oh, this is going to be like an easy laid back kind of day. I'll just watch a lot of doctors putting the x-ray up on the backlit screen and looking at bones and it's going to be a walk in the park. But instead, on my first day, um, we it was the day before 4th of July. So the first victim that came in had his fingers blown off by a firework. And we had to x-ray his hand to look at the damage to his fingers. And then the next person that came in was a gunshot victim that had a bullet lodged in the back of his brain. And then the next person that came in was a stabbing victim and the handle of the knife blade had broken off and the blade was somewhere in his abdomen and we had to figure out where the knife was inside of him. And after I saw the interaction with the patients who were suffering um, and in a lot of pain and just having the worst day of their life, that kind of made me realize like, I don't want to be in a setting on a day-to-day -day basis where I'm interacting with people when they're at their worst. And so then it kind of threw me into a whole spiral of, I thought my entire life I wanted to be a medical doctor. And now I'm in my senior year of high school and I just realized this isn't what I wanna be at all. What, what am I gonna do? What do I do from here? And I still love the medical field. I still loved anatomy. I still knew I wanted to do something related to biology. And that's where actually my, my high school English teacher comes in because he asked me, well, have you heard of bioengineering? Those are the engineers that make all of the different implants or medical devices that doctors use in the hospital to help people. So this could be a way for you to still be able to help people, for you to still be involved in biology, to do the, all the things that interest you, but you don't have to touch anybody and you don't have to see them when they're at their worst. And to me, I was like, wow, this sounds like the ideal career for me. This sounds like my dream job. And so I decided to pursue bioengineering after my English teacher suggested it to me. That's awesome. Um, a friend of mine who's a chemical engineer had a similar experience in high school in that it was her history or her English teacher that put her onto engineering. It's really wonderful that uh, you had that opportunity. And it's also 
um, I think a great lesson that as sure as you are at some point in your life that some career path is exactly what you want, sometimes when you spend even just a little bit of time actually doing that work, it turns out to be very different than what you imagined. And so exactly. I am a big believer in giving young students authentic experiences in these fields, because that's how you will know if you, you can try the lab coat on for size and it may, may, may be just right. And it may not. And then you can move on and figure that's out exactly what is right. right. Yeah. yeah. I love I'm that. so glad I got that opportunity because I cannot imagine what would have happened if I graduated with college with a lot of college debt, got into medical school and then realized there that I don't want to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or it's a wonderful story. So that's so great. And so you've been a bioengineer since then, uh, but have taken a bunch of different paths in bioengineering because it's not all one thing. Do you want to say a little bit about your educational path and your yeah. career from there? Yeah, thank you. Um, So yeah, I went to undergraduate at a really, really small technical school in Indiana. So I'm from Indiana and I bounced around a lot of different colleges within Indiana. I went to a small school called Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Um, it was actually all male up until 1995. And so when I went there in 2006, it was very much still kind of a male dominated field and a male dominated school. I think the women at that school were about 15% when I attended and the women's bathrooms weren't, there wasn't even a bathroom for women on every floor in our academic buildings. And some of our dorm rooms were even converted or co-ed because they just didn't have the space to even put the women so that was like a very interesting experience. And I could probably tell a million different stories just about that. But um, I made it through my undergrad and I really knew that I wanted to have a research career because when I graduated, it was during the around the 2008 recession. And so at the time, my dad, he was laid off and he wasn't um, he wasn't able to find work for a while. And I saw my mom and dad like really struggling financially. And also my dad was struggling a lot mentally because, you know, being the main breadwinner of a household and then having your career taken away from you, I think it puts a lot of stress and a lot of toll on a person. And so it kind of hit me and I realized like, well, you know, what if, what if I get laid off? Like, what, how am I going to support myself? And at the time I had a professor and I remember he made a comment and he was like, I can tell you guys that none of my friends that have a PhD are in the unemployment line right now. And for <laughs> that just stuck in my head. And I just realized at that moment, well, I guess I'm going to grad school then. So <laughs> I signed up to do a master's degree because where I went for undergrad, they didn't offer any research experience. So instead of getting straight into a PhD program, like a lot of people do after their undergrad, I went and did my master's at Purdue. And that's where I really learned how to do tissue engineering types of work. And that's where you're working with cell culture and you're patterning cells together in a certain way to have the cells regenerate and make miniature organs. Um, so I went to Purdue and that's where I learned like most of the skill set that became like the basic foundation for all of my research to come. And after I got my master's from Purdue, um, I worked on my master's in a cartilage regeneration lab. So we were reprogramming programming cartilage cells in the knees um, to start replicating again because um, your knees, they don't have any blood supply in them. So when you get an injury to your cartilage, your cartilage can't repair itself because there's no way to bring in new cells to the area to repopulate it. So we were trying to manipulate the cells that were already there to regenerate themselves. And that's what I worked on during that time. And then after that, um, I pivoted a bit and I went into cardiovascular bioengineering for my PhD. So in that lab, I was studying all about fluid flow and how fluid flow impacts remodeling in your heart, around your heart valves and downstream in your ascending aorta. And I was studying aortic aneurysms um, in that lab. And then after my PhD, I came out here to Boston and I did my postdoc in a cardiology based lab at um, Harvard Medical School. And there is where I worked with stem cells. And that's when I started to learn how to reprogram stem cells for different applications like drug development. So I worked a lot in a lot of different aspects, but <laughs> the main premise of cell culture is the same for a lot of different cell types. So once you learn one, you can, you can easily work with others. Oh, that's such a good thing for these students to hear too. We are not doing um, 
uh, mammalian cell culture in this uh, program, but we do teach aseptic technique and we teach a lot about growing cells in, in liquid and in solid media. And wow. uh, so there is imagine learning that in high school. That's amazing. These students are amazing and they are wow. getting really wonderful um, bit of jet fuel to launch their careers. And uh, yeah, that's their, incredible. Yeah, it's really terrific. So, um, so that's fantastic. I love um, the sort of openness you had in your, you know, educational path to, you know, the the topics you were interested in, but that the questions themselves were, you know, the, the platform, the cells themselves were um, just part of it, right? Um, yeah, so thank that, you. That's wonderful. And so, um, you know, if if you were uh, thinking about um, being in the job you are now, and it sounds like you really like it and that you're doing amazing work in it, um, is there anything that you would have perhaps done differently early on or maybe um, doubled down on uh, early on to help um, you get where you are now? <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking today, I really wish I took organic chemistry. <laughs> That's Ooh. one class I haven't had, actually. I just That's took funny. Gen Chem. So, um, yeah, I, I really miss, missed out on that one. And I'm <laughs> even thinking of enrolling in an undergraduate course for organic chemistry, because I think it would help me a lot with my career today. Um, but my main thing is just be open minded, always be flexible in your thinking. Don't tie yourself to um, a certain it has to be this or it has to be this research. I have to work on cartilage. When I got into this field, um, I really wanted to work on cartilage because rheumatoid arthritis runs in my family. And I had a cousin that got juvenile rheumatoid arthritis when she was three years old. And so every year when I would blow out the candles on my birthday cake, I would always wish for her to get better. And then as I progressed through my undergrad career, I realized like, wow, maybe I could actually study this and like do something to make a difference in the field and help her. Um, so that is kind of what fueled me getting through my master's. Um, and then during my master's degree, my, my father unexpectedly passed away um, from cardio, cardiac complications. And then that's kind of what made me pivot over to the cardiology field. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really great to have um, passions that you feel can be fulfilling and to fuel you and keep you um, wanting to know more and wanting to learn more. But one of one of the things I read recently that I really liked is somebody said, when you're writing out your life plan, make sure you write it with pencil mm. so you can erase it and start over if you need to. So I think that's like a great piece of advice is um, just remaining flexible and open and, and just following your heart. Oh, I love that. I'm going to keep my pencils close by. I think that's amazing advice. How fabulous. Um, I, I have asked you lots of questions. I want to make sure that the students, if they have questions, can either drop them in the chat or can come on, on mute um, before we let you go and, and you can. Great. Yeah, I'm happy before. to answer anything. Else. I will say you're also a wonderful teacher and, and I hope that you will, um, you know, as, as your life <laughs> continues to meander and you could maybe pencil in, in teaching at some point. Cause um, yeah, that was but, one of the things I loved about my, my postdoc was my mentorship. Mm -hmm. I do also, um, Moderna offers internships and co-ops. I just hired a co-op to join me for six months. She's an undergraduate at Northeastern university. So, um, if anyone is interested while they're, you know, going to undergrad and learning science to look at, look on LinkedIn to the career portal in Moderna um, and see what we have to offer for young people because there's a lot of opportunities here. So I would encourage you to do that. And of course I love outreach and I'm involved with young women in bio. So um, we are recruiting right now in this cycle. If you go to my next slide, there's a QR code there where we are recruiting our next set of YWIB ambassadors. So if you're a high school student and you wanna work with me as your mentor, um, we are taking applications for that. And it's a great organization in Boston. Um, and we work closely with high school students to help them on a path to college and get them inspired with STEM. So um, if you are a young lady that wants to get involved, please check out our link on that QR code and fill out an application. I think that it is a wonderful organization. We work very closely with YWIB and um, have there's so much talent there and so much um, desire to turn around and help the next in line. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
There are a couple of questions about your current work. If you have another minute to spend just talking Absolutely. about your yes. work, that would be great. Um, so uh, one of the questions is about um, uh, thinking about how organ uh, organ on a chip can help with, with testing. Um, this is a little bit related to the question of more about the projects that you're working on. So maybe um, making that link between the organ on a chip and what a test for safety looks like or something oh, like that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we can, we can do is at Moderna, we can give um, a gene that makes cells glow. And so we can monitor in real time how fast our protein is being, our gene is being made into a protein and then how fast our cells are expressing that. And simultaneously, we can give them um, another dye that reacts with cells that are dying. So we can monitor in real time as they're producing protein, are they also healthy? Is it killing them? What's going on with them? So we can look at, it's called a cytotoxicity assay. So we can look at cell death in real time on top of when we give our drug and see, are our cells still healthy while they're receiving our drugs? So that's one of the standard assays that we run a lot. That's great. And just to connect it back to the work that these students are doing just on Saturday, they did a viability assay on a liquid overnight culture of bacteria that they had. Awesome. They were comparing total cell count using a spectrophotometer versus the number of viable cells that they were able to serial, serially dilute and then count. Um, so yeah, that's the, something I do on a daily basis. That's there awesome. You go. There you go. Very so. practical skills. Absolutely. That is the goal of this. So um, there are some additional questions about the um, uh, platforms that you've been studying. So uh, replication of, say, nerve cells and also a little bit more about the cardiovascular engineering. Um, uh, as I say, these students are culturing bacterial cells, so don't okay. have a direct line of sight into culturing mammalian cells. So maybe if there's any high level thoughts about culturing difficult versus easy cells to culture. Um, you could say something about that. Yeah. So um, there, I think you guys have probably heard of cell lines, which come from cancer cells. So they have either had some kind of mutation to their DNA that helps them replicate kind of unlimited amounts of time versus primary cells in the body that have a limited potential for regeneration. So I work with both and from a standpoint of thinking about a bacteria, how you can grow multiple colonies out of one single bacteria because it keeps doubling in population. That's a lot like a cell line. So if you've ever heard of like HeLa cells or HEC cells, um, HeLa's are probably the most famous, but that's one way where you can kind of relate it back to bacteria where cell lines are kind of like that, where they grow unlimited potential, whereas primary cells, um, they, they have a limit to the amount of times you can expand them. That's great. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I hope everyone who can apply to this uh, YWIB ambassador program will do that. Um, this has been wonderful, Samantha. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your afternoon. And um, uh, yes, I have people in the chat saying thank you so much. And oh, thanks. Um, we will uh, follow up for sure if there are additional questions or thoughts. Yeah, if anyone has a burning question, feel free to email me. I'm happy yeah. to respond and, yeah. and share over email. We'll pass them on. Thank you so much. You're welcome to yeah. stick around. We're going to make some more next PBS, but I think you've probably seen that before. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Best of luck with your career. And thanks for listening today. I really appreciate having this opportunity to share. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's great to talk to you. Well, bye.